So we've embarked on a new year, 2018. For most of us, it really starts tomorrow. Would that be true? We've sort of been uh, relaxed, disconnected. And so it is quite fitting that I should be here to share what God's given to me. Now, whilst it's our calendar year 2018, it's actually the Hebrew year 5778. The Hebrew year actually commenced in September of last year, so we're sort of well into it. But there's some deep truths, I believe, that we can discover as we contemplate the meaning of the year 5778. And I trust this morning you'll go away with the sure knowledge that this is a year of covenant grace, covenant protection and covenant trust. Now as we have a look at this year, I want you to keep in mind this particular scripture, Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. I want you to constantly be asking yourself the question, am I willing in this year of 2018? The other thing that captures my attention in this scripture is Jerusalem. And the meaning of the name Jerusalem is to learn peace. Am I willing to learn peace? Okay, now before we embark on the year 5778, we need to lay a bit of a foundation. And for those of you who haven't heard me speak before, you probably need a bit of a foundation. So here we have the Hebrew alphabet, their Aleph Tav, which is equivalent to our A to Z. Now, the unusual thing about Hebrew is that each letter in the Hebrew alphabet actually has a picture attached to it because before Hebrew was a written language, it was a pictorial language. So, for instance, the first letter, Aleph, has the picture of an ox attached to it. And it speaks of leadership and strength. So with that bit of information, we can then look at Hebrew numerals. And again, we find something a little unusual because all of their numerals are understood by looking at the letters in the Hebrew alphabet that they are derived from. So the number one is the first letter in their alphabet, Aleph. So the number one depicts leadership and strength. So with that background, we can now look at 5,778. What we discover is that 5,000 is depicted by the letters Yud and He, 700 by the letters Tav and Sheen, and 70 is depicted by the letter Ayin, and 88, rather, is depicted by the letter Chet. So let's look now at the pictures that are attached to these letters, and thus to the numbers. Yud is the picture of a hand. Hay is the picture to reveal or behold. Tav is the picture of a sign and the idea of covenant. Sheen is the picture of teeth or consumes. Ayin is the picture of an eye or the idea of seeing. And Chet is the picture of a fence or that which protects 
and that which separates. When we put all of those together, we end up with this. Hand to reveal, covenant that consumes the eye, which protects. Now just ponder that for a moment and ask yourself the question, where do we first see this picture in scripture? Where do we first see hand to reveal, covenant that consumes the eye, which protects? The Garden of Eden. Did you know the Garden of Eden was a fenced or protected garden? And the word picture meaning behind garden is to lift up life. And the word Eden actually means eternal life. And it also means pleasure or delight. Is it possible that Eden before the fall is a picture of God's kingdom on earth? A picture of Matthew 6 verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The answer to that question is yes. We end up with a rather more difficult question and that is what was the serpent, Satan, doing in God's kingdom come to earth? Well, hopefully we'll answer that before we finish today. When does the Garden of Eden appear in the creation account? In Genesis 2, verse 2, we read, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And then in that same chapter in verse 8, we read, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. Could it be that the garden was actually planted on the eighth day? So God finished creating on the seventh and then he planted the garden on the eighth. And in Hebrew, the number eight stands for new beginnings. So Hebrew, in Hebrew, they will often refer to, for example, tomorrow as the first day of the new week. Or would that be today? Probably today. So it's this whole idea of a new beginning. So which day of the week was Yeshua raised from the dead? The first day of the week the eighth day, a day of new beginnings. So could it be that the planting of the Garden of Eden was in fact heaven come to earth? I believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is the garden. Yeshua, Jesus, is the tree of life. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9 we read, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the interesting word in this verse, there's two interesting words. The first one is ground. And it's the same uh, word that's used in Genesis 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Hebrew word is Adamah. So Adam was created out of the Adamah. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here we have the first picture of the uh, incarnation. We see the, the tree of life who is Yeshua, is planted into the dust of humanity. In John 15 verse 1, Jesus refers to himself saying, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He could well have said, I am the tree of life 
and my father is the gardener. And in 1 John 5, 11 we read, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal, remember, that's what Eden means, he has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. The other interesting word here is the word midst. The word picture meaning behind the, this little word midst is to make a covenant joining together a path or way of life. So here in Genesis 2 verse 9, we see the Father's intention from the very beginning that we as humanity would enter into a covenant relationship with his son who is the tree of life. So let's summarise where we've reached. So God's delight, his desire, was that Adam and Eve would extend their hands to eat of the tree of life, thus entering into the protective covenant of life in his son. And we find this depicted beautifully in John 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And we could translate that this way. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat of the tree of life and drink of the river of life, you have no life in you. We've just looked at one side of the year 5778, and that's the whole understanding of living inside God's protection. Let's now turn our attention to the other aspect of the meaning of 5778, and it is the hand to reveal covenant that consumes the eye which separates. And again, I ask the question, where do we first see this picture in scripture? And I'm sure you're well ahead of me this time and you're saying, it's going to be Genesis, isn't it? And it is. In Genesis 3 verse 6, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So what is really at the heart of the fall? I believe that what in essence was going on in the fall was that mankind was judging that God and his grace are not to be trusted. In Hebrew, the word picture meaning behind trust is inside the fence. And the word picture meaning for grace is the fence that protects life. The first letter in the Hebrew words for trust and grace are in fact the letter Chet, which is our number eight. If we look at the, the account of the fall from a Hebrew perspective, what we actually hear the serpent saying to Eve is, God said, so what? Eve, God said that, so what? There's another voice. Listen carefully, that little voice inside you. You can trust that voice. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil equals judgment. Hence, Jesus warned us in Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2 and said quite bluntly, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 
when we covenant with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when we eat the fruit of judgment, it not only consumes our eye, but it separates us from God's grace, from his protection. And sadly, as we do that as individuals and as a society, we end up in the place that Isaiah described in Isaiah 5 verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Sadly, that verse describes our culture today. The word picture meaning for sin is the fence of the snake's strength. It's a great picture to memorise that one. The fence of the snake's strength. The root of sin is represented by a diet of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is a diet of judgment based on what we perceive to be good and evil rather than accepting what God said is good and evil. So this brings us to what we might call the elephant in the room because whenever you start talking about grace there's always the issue of law versus grace. I'm sure you've heard people say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. And I'll put my hand up and say, for decades, that was me. I'm not under law, I'm under grace. But sadly, that reflected my own ignorance of the whole idea of law and grace from a Hebrew perspective. In Exodus 24 verse 12 we read, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So let's look at the law and commandments. So our English word law is actually the Hebrew word Torah. And Torah means direction or instruction. And here the word pictures are very powerful. The word picture for Torah is what comes from the man nailed to the cross. And one of the other word pictures is what helps point out the target of life. So if you want to figure out what your target for 2018 is, then... Look at what comes from the man nailed to the cross. Our English word commandments is the Hebrew word mitzvah. And mitzvah means code of wisdom. And the word picture is water of motivation to obey is strong. Yeshua referred to himself as the living water. And when we drink of the living water, our motivation to obey becomes strong. You see, the Torah and commandments, what we categorise as the law, were given by God to enable us to experience the protection of his grace. Did you know that on the day of Pentecost, which we know as the day of the Holy Spirit, was poured out. It's exactly the same day that the Hebrew communities celebrate the giving of the Torah. So when we understand that, it gives new meaning to verses like John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And it's also interesting that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Adam and Eve extended their hands and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
the fruit of judgment, thus choosing the fence of the snake's strength rather than the protective instruction and direction of God's grace. In this year, 5778, and indeed in this year, 2018, the Lord is calling his people back to Eden, back to the place of trust, back to the place of grace and knowing his protection. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, Paul writes, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It is pretty remarkable for Paul to record this. Paul's life was a a series of events that went from beatings to imprisonment to a shipwreck to being chased all over the place, fearing for his life. But for him, the answer to all of that was the voice of the Lord saying, my grace is sufficient. This is actually the answer to our question, why was the serpent in the garden? The answer is, my grace is sufficient. This is the answer to all that Job went through. My grace is sufficient. This is the answer to Peter, both before and after he denied Yeshua. My grace is sufficient. In fact, this is the answer to everything that Jen and I have experienced since we moved from Canberra back to Bathurst. It's been hard. None of our plans have come to fruition. But slowly and surely, we're hearing it clearly, the Lord saying, my grace is sufficient. My protection is sufficient. And I believe that whatever question confronts you this year, this is the answer. His grace, his protection is sufficient. But you may well ask Richard, that's great, that's, oh, I, I can feel that, that's, oh, that's motivating. But how do we practically live in this truth? In Genesis 2 verse 15 we read, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden, to dress it and to keep it. The word keep means to guard, observe, give heed. I believe that part of Adam and Eve's unique God-given purpose was actually to co-labour with him in maintaining that fence that enclosed Eden. Now it's very difficult for me to talk about grace without talking about Noah's Ark. Because it's in the account of Noah that we first find the actual word grace. In Genesis 6 verse 8 we read, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now there's three really important things to know about the Ark. First of all, we know that it was built of wood Secondly, we know that it was lined inside and out with pitch. And the word pitch actually shares the same root meaning as the word atonement, which we associate with blood. So the ark was made of wood and it was lined inside and out with this symbol of blood. And the third interesting thing is that we know that the ark was built as Noah obeyed the directions and instructions of God. So it was built through obedience. 
And those three things combine to give us a clear picture of grace. Now, where else in scripture do you find wood, blood and obedience? The cross. And so the ark is this powerful picture of the cross. Our protection is found in the sacrifice of Yeshua. And in the account of Noah and the ark, there's another pointer back to Eden. And we find that in Genesis 8 verse 4. And the ark rested on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. You'll never guess what the name Ararat means. It means reverse the curse. In Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 3, Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. And Paul's words to me are a powerful reminder of our calling to keep the garden. For each one of us to become stewards of God's grace and God's protection. So what does this stewardship of God's grace look like? First of all, it looks like trust. Choosing moment by moment, day by day, to live inside the fence of God's protective grace. Secondly, it looks like learning how to maintain the fence that protects life. And thirdly, it looks like learning how to eat of the tree of life and thus enter into the mystery which Paul spoke of in Colossians 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How does Christ get in you? As you eat of the tree of life and drink of the river of life. How do we maintain the fence of God's grace? First and foremost, we must refuse to continue eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We must refuse to judge, refuse to walk in unforgiveness and refuse to withhold love. How do we steward God's grace? We must learn to eat from the tree of life, extending protection to everyone we meet. And this is reflected in our desire to bless everyone, even those who curse us. To forgive everyone, even our enemies. And to love even the unlovable. I want to share with you from my prayer journal what I've called the parable of the paling fence. And I recorded this back on the 15th of July of last year. This was the seed that was planted for the message I've shared with you this morning. And slowly but surely it's been watered and nurtured and nourished. And I simply wrote at the top of the page, judge not, big question mark. And this is what I sense the father say. Richard, I never gave the words judge not that you should not be judged as some law or rule for you to just follow. I said this for your protection as a means by which you can extend grace to others. Whenever you choose not to judge someone, you are actually constructing a protective fence around them rather than following a commandment or law that I have passed. In doing this, you are protecting relationship with that person. Remember, Richard, I see everything through the lens of relationship. 
But not only are you protecting the person you choose not to judge, you are also protecting yourself. Remember I went on to say, for the measure you use in judging others will be measured back to you. Every time you choose to judge another, it is like removing a paling from the fence of my grace that I have built around you to protect you and to protect your true life, which is relationship with me. When you choose to judge, there is a withdrawal from the relationship account of the person you judge and a withdrawal from your own relationship account. If you do judge, and I would insert, and you will, Richard, repent quickly and I will reverse these transactions. I will restore that paling that was removed from my fence of grace around you. The choice not to judge is quite simple. Before you enter into judgment, ask yourself the question, do I have all the facts? Whilst you may appear to have many facts, you will never have the fact of a person's thoughts and intentions flowing from their heart. Remember, you are limited to looking at outward appearances. I alone look on the heart. I can reveal the thoughts and intentions of a person's heart to you, but it will never be for judgment. Rather, it will be for the restoration of relationship. Remember, Richard, I see everything through the lens of relationship. You have misunderstood my intention when I encouraged you not to judge others. I did so to elevate the importance of relationship. Your relationship with me and your relationship with others Judgment is not my weapon. It is a pathway that leads to deeper relationship. Remember, Richard, I have all the facts. So when I choose to judge, it looks very different to when you choose to judge. Judgment from a human perspective is often a matter of self-justification. If judgment separates you from true relationship, then it will surely separate you from experiencing true justification. Because of your relationship with me, being in Christ, you are constantly in a place of being justified, or as you might put it, being just as if you had never sinned. True justification is experienced through relationship. So when you refuse to judge someone else to justify your own thoughts or actions, you are putting relationship with me and with that person first. Herein lies the true reality of being justified. You see, Richard, when you choose not to judge someone, you are placing them in a position where you consider them as being as if they had never sinned. My prayer for you in this new year of 2018 is that you would join me in learning what it really means to live inside the sure knowledge that we are protected by God's grace. Thank you.